Today, we're going to be talking about neural sequence models for language. These models are usually used for language modeling and also representation learning. Those are the most common use cases. In language modeling, you have some prefix or context, and you need to predict the next word. In representation learning, you just want to turn a bunch of text into a vector. We'll talk more about language modeling soon. But these are really complicated and don't give a good idea of what's going on inside the models very well. So let's start with something much simpler today, sentiment analysis. This is a fairly common NLP task. Piece of text comes in and you need to say whether it has positive sentiment or negative sentiment. Imagine, say, that you're the best burrito chain to come out of Colorado. No, not that one. And you want to check whether people are saying good things or bad things about your burritos. To do that, you label each message with a sentiment score, and then afterwards, for additional analysis, you could aggregate by time or geolocation. So here, for example, positive sentiment, tweet, negative sentiment tweet. A very simple algorithm to do that is to have dictionaries of positive and negative words. Add up the positive words and subtract the negative words to get a score. This is a really naive method, but there are a number of companies that made a lot of money in the 90s and early 2000s that did basically just this, counting up positive negative words, giving a score for every piece of text. But we're in the 2020s now. Everything needs to be neural networks or it isn't worth anything. So I'm going to show you how to repackage this wordless technique as a neural network. Now, the specific neural network that we're talking about today is the recurrent neural network. The first thing you need to do is to decide on the granularity of its input. This is language dependent. In English, this could be at the white space delineated token level or at the character level. For the purposes of what we're going to talk about today, we're going to use the tokens, words, whatever you want to call it, because this is just kind of a toy example and we're going to be looking up those individual tokens in our sentiment dictionary. The next question is how to represent the words. Mathematically, we're going to represent each of the tokens x0 up to xl, the length of the sentence, one for every token of the input with a vector. But what vector representation are we going to use? We're going to assume that each word, each unique token has a specific vector representation. This is familiar from word to vec This could be something that you learn here in the context of this model, or you could just use it off the shelf from something like as I mentioned, word to vec But for the purposes of this very simple toy example, it's not going to be anything like that. It's going to be much simpler. I'm just going to give you a little rule to create your vector representations of words. If it's a positive word, like excellent or cromulent, then it's going to be a one-hot vector with the first dimension having the one. If it's a negative word, like bad or meh, then it will be a one-hot vector with one in the second index. Something else we'll call a zero vector. Associated with every token in your input is a hidden vector. This vector could have any dimension you want. It doesn't have to match the input word representations. So what's the hidden layer doing? As you go along the sentence with each input, a great burrito, each of the vectors in the hidden layers is representing the current state of the sentence as you're going along. Once you get to the end of the sentence, you can then use that hidden representation that's hopefully capturing everything that went on in the sentence to do something else. That could be a classification or a regression 
that gives you the output that you want using the final hidden vector as an input. This is all a bit abstract, so let's connect it back to our motivating sentiment example. Normally, the dimensions of the hidden vector don't mean anything. They're learned. But I'm defining what's happening in this model. We're not learning it from the data. So I can tell you what they mean. Let's declare that the first dimension of the hidden vector is a total number of positive words so far. And the second dimension is the total number of negative words so far. Then, at the end of the sentence, we want to have an output, a la a regression, that gives the total number of positive words minus the total number of negative words. So if you go along in this sentence and do this at every time step, at first, it's zero, positive matches negative, then you have one positive word, then at the next step, you still have the one positive word and no negative words. Then in the final time step, we don't see any sentiment words, so we just carry that one over one more time step. Let's just recap, so we're all on the same page. We have a hidden vector where the first dimension says how many positive sentiment words we have, the second dimension says how many negative sentiment words we have. Then, at the end, we want to output the difference between the positive and the negative as our final output. Okay, so now that we've defined what the hidden vector should look like, how do we get those hidden vectors to look like that? Here's the equation for creating the hidden state. You take the observation that came in x, multiply it, by an observation matrix W that maps the input word token character representation into your hidden space, add that to the previous hidden state multiplied by an evolution matrix that maps the previous hidden state to the current hidden state, and add a bias term. You pass all of that through nonlinearity. We'll use ReLU for the ease of computation, and then you get your new hidden state. So now let's go through the matrices that we'd need for this to work the way that we want it to on our toy sentiment example. Both the observation dimension and the hidden dimension are two, and the matrices end up being quite simple. The zero vector for the bias and the identity for both the observation and hidden evolution matrices. So let's go through an example. This movie is an exquisite masterpiece despite the questionable title. So that corresponds to observations that look like this. Exquisite and Masterpiece have one in the first dimension. Questionable has a one in the second index. And everything else is a zero vector. So then you go left to right and you compute the hidden vector. It stays zero, zero until you get to Exquisite. And then it becomes one, zero. With Masterpiece, it becomes to zero, and then it doesn't change until you get to questionable at the end. At which point, the hidden vector becomes 2, 1. Because questionable was a negative sentiment word, so it populates that second dimension. Then, to get the final output prediction y, you take the total positive words and subtract the negative words to get the final score of 1. Now, at this point, you're thinking, why was this even a neural network? Did you need a recurrent neural network to do this? You could have just counted the stuff up directly. And you're right, this was just a warm-up to introduce the ideas and the notation. Let's expand our universe. Instead of just having positive and negative words, you could also have words that invert the sentiment. These are words like not and are in the linguistics terminology called negations. But because we're talking about positive and negative sentiment to avoid confusion with negative sentiment and negation, I'm going to just call them inverters. 
Hopefully that's okay. It's only for right here, right now. The rest of the time, call them negation, not inverters. Inverters is a weird word for this. Now, inverters don't have sentiment on their own, but if you have a phrase like not bad, the not flips the sentiment of the word that comes after it. So if you want to capture that, we're going to need to expand our hidden vector to account for a richer state space. First off, we need to know if we've seen an inverter. So the first change is that the token encoding will need to tell us if a word is an inverter. After we do that, we'll be able to count how many inverted positive words and negative words we've seen to get to the correct true sentiment score. Now the next big change is going to be to our hidden state space. The first two states count the number of positive and negative words just like we had before. The third state in the hidden vector is going to be one if and only if the previous word was an inverter. There are five states in total. The next two states are one if and only if we have an inverter followed by a sentiment word. Of course, we're going to also need to change our parameters. The top left of the observation to hidden state parameter matrix looks like it did before. The bottom, though, is different. The states for the inverted positive and negative sentiment are triggered when the previous state was an inverter token. But then the top right adds in the counts from the inverted sentiment to our accumulators from before, the first two dimensions of the hidden vector, but then subtracts out the counts so that we don't double count. We'll see an example in a little bit, but normally good would count as a positive sentiment word. But if it's been inverted, we need to subtract that out because we're keeping the normal mechanism for having good contribute to positive sentiment when it isn't preceded by an inverter. The word to hidden state parameter matrix is next, but beware that I've transposed it here to fit everything on one side. So let's go through it bit by bit. The left is the same as before, plus we extend the diagonal to encode the inverter words. The right is just a flip of the sentiment words. That makes sense. Not good is a negative sentiment term. So when you get an inverter, it needs to combine with a word that by itself was positive to become negative. Then the bias term has negative one for the last two states. This is because the logic acts like an and operator. You must have both an inverter word and the corresponding sentiment word. If you have none of them, you get an input of minus one to rel u and a zero output. If you only have one, you have an input of zero and again an output of zero. You need both of them, the inverter and the sentiment word, to trigger those final two states. So let's take a look at an example. Not joking, food is not horrible, it's delicious. We're going to go through this word by word, matrix multiplication by matrix multiplication, but only for one example sentence here but there are more in the slides. Check the description for a link to the course webpage. Not is the first word. The initial hidden state is zero. So this first part of the equation does nothing acting on the hidden state, but because the word representation of not says that it's an inverter, that will combine with the other two zeros to turn the next hidden state to the third position. So we now move on to the next word, joking. However, joking is not a sentiment word at all. So even though we're looking for a sentiment word to invert, we can trigger these last two states. The observed tokens are consistent with that. So it doesn't trigger and our state goes back to zero. Then nothing happens for a bit. But then we see not, which puts us back into the inverter state. After that, we see horrible, a negative sentiment word. Remember, one in the second token representation position. Now we've triggered two hidden states. We have one plus one in the fourth dimension to overcome the ReLU, but it also triggers the normal negative sentiment. This is a little confusing, but it gets cleared up on the next token.
And then the inverted sentiment becomes a real positive sentiment word. Let's go through that. So the one and the minus one cancel out. So we're left with one in the first position of the hidden vector. That means we've seen one positive sentiment word. Next up, we have a normal positive sentiment word. Delicious. So that triggers the first position and the last in the observation contribution to our hidden vector. But there's no previous inverter word. So it gets canceled out by the bias. And then we add the new positive contribution to the previous contribution to get the final value of two for positive sentiment words. Now you're probably thinking of all the ways that this RNN is crap. It doesn't handle determiners. Not a bad film. Double negative. Not not good. And words of different intensity. Okay versus fantastic. And that's all true. But that's part of the limitations of using a dictionary, not a limitation of the underlying neural architecture. Dictionary-based methods that inspired the tiny example that I wanted to show you are old-fashioned and not useful in today's world compared to more robust techniques. Again, that's a weakness of the parameters that I chose, not of the underlying models. These models didn't have enough parameters to do really incredible stuff that is now associated with neural networks. In other words, blame the stupid parameters, not the model. The thing is, with good objectives, good training data, not to mention computational frameworks, with backpropagation, you can learn matrices, parameters that do a much, much better job of the sentiment analysis task. And that's because you do a better job of encoding the state of a sentence for that downstream task. And it also lets you do much fancier things than sentiment analysis. Modern natural language processing uses these representations for language modeling and contextual representations, which we'll be talking about next, because you should be using these architectures to learn from data, not just taking what some expert says for you to do with your data. This is just one video from a course that I'm teaching. If you want to get the whole context, check out the course webpage linked below. There you can find all of the videos in the right order. YouTube likes to show you older videos out of order, homeworks, exercises, and recommended readings. And if you want to help other people find videos like this, please be sure to like and subscribe to provide a big gradient to the algorithm.